this evening, uh, I want to talk to you about a part of the Greek world which probably does not often impinge on your consciousness as such, though the British School at Athens did sponsor and publish important excavations at Tokra in Cyrenaica in 1963-65, to 65, um, conducted by John Boardman and John Hales. But in the 7th century BC, when the people of Thera asked the oracle at Delphi for advice and were told to found a settlement in Libya, at first they did nothing because they had no idea where it was. <laughs> Subsequently, they were told again by the oracle to do the same thing and they had to ask about until they found a seaman on Crete who could show them the way. As you can see from the map, Cyrenaica, ringed here, is actually not far from Crete. And Cyrene is closer as the crow flies to Athens than it is to Tripoli. The settled area of Cyrenaica comprises the limestone plateau which rises from the coast in two steps. Uh, can, can we have the lights down a bit up front here? I don't think it makes it easier to see. So it rises from the coast to a height of about 800 meters and it therefore attracts sufficient rainfall for some quite productive agriculture. It's known now by the Arabic name of Jebel Akhtar, the Green Mountain. There is snow in winter at the upper levels. The terrain and the climate may readily be compared with that of the Aegean world, and the colonists from Thera, who founded the city of Cyrene, according to tradition, in 631 BC, would have felt pretty much at home. The Greeks encountered a small indigenous population, which having been at first sympathetic, became understandably hostile as the number of Greeks increased and the new settlers took over more and more of the best land. The plateau, marked by the uh, darker area here, extends roughly 300 kilometers east to west and is barely 100 kilometers wide extending southwards from the coast uh, and falling off very gradually on the southern side into the desert, uh, as you see here. It gets just gradually drier and drier. As the Greek settlers increased in number, so they naturally founded other settlements. And by the first century BC, the region had come to be known as Pentapolis, a federation of five cities. These were Cyrene, uh, its port Apollonia, then Ptolemaeus, Taukira, or Tokra, and US Perides, later Berenike, which lie beneath modern Benghazi. Cyrene was the dominant city for much of antiquity, and when the last Hellenistic king of Cyrene, Ptolemy Appian, died in 96 BC, he bequeathed his kingdom to the Senate and people of Rome. The Romans were initially somewhat underwhelmed by this gift and largely ignored it <laughs> until the suppression of piracy in the eastern Mediterranean became a priority in the 60s BC. And in 67, Cyrene was joined to Crete as a single Roman province and so passed fully under a Roman administration which was to persist until the arrival of the Arabs in AD 645. There was thus in this region a seamless transition from Roman to Byzantine and it's unnecessary to argue over precisely the one we came about. Of the cities highlighted here, only one U.S. Perides and Berenike is overlaid by a local city of Benghazi. Otherwise, all of them dwindled away during the Arab period. When the population began to increase again, really only in the 19th century, the new centers of settlement by no means followed the previous pattern, 
And this is a major reason why the ancient sites have lain relatively undisturbed until modern times. In scholarly terms, Cyrene itself has received the most attention. It's been explored by Italian archaeologists since 1913 when winter storms exposed this beautiful statue of Venus in the middle of an army camp. <coughs> it was then, uh, quite surprisingly, carried off to Rome and was only returned to Libya uh, by Berlusconi in 2008. Since the discovery of that statue, the Italians have carried out extensive excavations and reconstructions. The site of which you see a pan here uh, is at a height of about 600 meters above sea level on the edge of the upper level of the Saranacan Plateau. It occupies two ridges, uh, a southern one here and then a northern one here with a re-entrant between them, which leads down uh, into the lower level of the plateau at a height of about uh, 300 meters. Uh, and that leads down from the upper city past a sanctuary terrace there dedicated to Apollo. The northern part of the city has been explored far less than the southern ridge, though it houses an important temple of Zeus, a hippodrome for chariot races, and uh, other buildings of which only uh, fragments have yet been exposed. The southern ridge encompasses many public buildings, including the original Greek civic centre or Agora, a Roman forum, and three theatres. So let's have a look at some of these. This is the Roman Forum, known here from an inscription as the Caesarea. It was built, first of all, in the 2nd century BC as a gymnasium, and it was converted <coughs> only towards the end of the 1st century AD into a forum with an adjoining basilica. The reconstruction that you see here was done in the 1930s. Next to the Caesarium is a long wall topped by huge windows uh, between which were alternating figures of Hermes and Heracles, the divine patrons of athletic sport. This was attached to the gymnasium and was, uh, when the earlier building uh, fulfilled that function, it was at Sistos, or covered running track and it was later converted into a simple portico next to the street in the Roman period. On the opposite side of the street, in the second century AD, there came into being a very rich uh, private residence created by buying up two adjacent city blocks and suppressing the street in between. This is known as the house of Jason Magnus uh, from the name of a proprietor recorded in mosaic in a little temple just next door to it. It was richly adorned with mosaics and had a particularly fine summer triclinium, uh, a dining room, which you see uh, here, <coughs> which was paved with opus septile, a form of paving which in the Roman period we know was actually valued more highly than mosaic. Down below this ridge was the sanctuary of Apollo, which you see here. <coughs> the columns of the Temple of Apollo in the centre of the picture. In the distance is the lower level of the Cyrenaican Plateau, bounded at its further edge by another steep drop, which leads down to the port of Apollonia on the narrow coastal strip. And what you see in the distance is not the shoreline, it is the edge of that lower step of the gerbil. Uh, beyond this, this here is still 300 meters or so above sea level, and then there's a steep drop to a narrow coastal strip. The sanctuary of Apollo, it seems to me, with its dense cluster of lesser temples and treasuries around that of the 
patron god of Cyrene uh, is curiously reminiscent of Apollo's other great sanctuary at Delphi. But we must move on from Cyrene. There is so much else to talk about. But before we go, we ought at least to pay homage to the great temple of Zeus. This was built in the Doric style, and the surrounding colonnade that you see here was erected in the early 5th century BC, possibly slightly later than the core of the original building. Um, they are structurally separate. One Once again, you must not suppose that what you see now has stood like this since antiquity. The colonnade was in fact felled in AD 115 during the Jewish revolt, which started in Cyrene and afflicted much of the eastern Mediterranean. The very core of the temple was restored after that. The columns were never set up again until the 20th century. Uh, and in fact, the uh, Italian uh, archaeologist who was responsible for putting them up uh, told me that the Romans did try to re-erect the colonnade uh, in the second century AD, but they got the height wrong. And after they put up three of the columns, uh, they realized they were on a height of nothing, and they gave up. Um, you can see from the plan of the building as excavated, that the collapse of the colonnade was not due to earthquake, which is otherwise <coughs> uh, a, a regular issue with antiquities in this part of the world. If it had been felled by earthquake, the columns would all have fallen in the same direction. But they haven't. They've all fallen outwards, and in fact, the lowest drums of some of them show where they've been <coughs> undercut um, by uh, hacking away just as if you were felling a tree. Uh, and to me, trying to imagine somebody doing that and judging at what moment to <laughs> run like hell, <laughs> hardly bears thinking about it. But evidently, uh, the Jews were so furious that they did that. The uh, re-erection of the temple has taken place over a long period uh, a corps of British Army engineers re-erected the first uh, column and a half, uh, as you see there. Um, subsequent photos were taken by myself uh, in 1972, uh, in 1981, and then finally, as I showed you before, 2009. Around about 2000, I think the Italians finished. Uh, what they plan to do. So I promised we were going to leave Cyrene and we shall, we shall take the ancient road to Apollonia, um, which now has an asphalt surface, but this is the road created in the 6th century BC, leading down towards the coast to the north. And as you can see here, Cyrene has one of the most extensive necropolis of any Greek city known to us. This is a plan now of Apollonia. Uh, much of the site has sunk beneath the surface of the sea since antiquity. Uh, those parts, including all the harbour installations, are readily identifiable below the water, and they're shown here in pale blue, which differentiates the modern shoreline from the ancient one. What has been excavated here belongs principally to late antiquity, the 5th to 7th centuries AD, when Cyrene was in decline and Apollonia had become the capital of the Roman province of Libya and Tapolis. This general view, uh, taken from the top floor of the Manara Hotel, built abusively on the necropolis just outside the west gate of the city, shows the present lie of the land. Uh, the two islands are all that is left of the outer defences of the double harbour, uh, and the west gate of the city was guarded by this great bastion here, and is actually in that position there. 
We shall linger here on just two picturesque monuments which illustrate the history of the city. Here, the columns against the sea belong not to a classical temple, but to a Christian church of the 6th century AD. Note en passant that this church was built from a kit, as we know a number were uh, in this period. All of the columns at the east end, together with the chancel screens, are uniform and of Proconetian marble. But either the money ran out before the rest had been bought, or maybe the second half of the consignment ended up in the bottom of the sea on its way and never arrived. Uh, but in any event, the remainder of the columns, these ones you see here, they are in local stone. Uh, they would have been uh, stuccoed and rendered, so they would have looked approximately like the other ones. But clearly the intention must have been that the whole thing would have been marble. Next, charmingly situated just outside the wall circuit of the late 2nd century BC, are the remains of the theatre which was built at roughly the same time. You see only the foundations of the seating here, for the seats themselves and the whole of the stage building were stripped out in the Byzantine period, probably to repair the defences at that point, um, possibly in the face of Arab attack in the 640s, or equally uh, when there was great anxiety about the uh, the Sasanian, the Persian conquest of Egypt in 610. Um, they were driven out again by uh, Heraclius, uh, but that might well have occasioned a hasty erection of defences in Salamanca. Ptolemaeus lies on the coast some way to the west of Cyrene uh, and Apollonia. And again, I show you just the plan here initially. It goes back to the 7th century BC, though the visible ruins are mostly no earlier than the 4th century BC, which is probably when it acquired the name by which we know it. The city was provided at that time with a grossly over-ambitious wall circuit, uh, which could never have been defended in its entirety, uh, and of which the Tankira gate, the gate towards Tokra, uh, number 30 on the plan here is the most notable surviving fragment. Upstanding ruins and limited excavations encompass a number of buildings, uh, including uh, a late Hellenistic palace, possibly a governor's palace, uh, but again, one, one is a little bit nervous nowadays of saying that sort of thing when you find a fantastically rich house somewhere and you think, oh, this must be the governor's palace. Um, Twenty years later, you've got three more. Uh, <laughs> and you realise these are just very rich people. Um, but interestingly, in this one uh, were found some Egyptian antiquities, clearly part of an art collection, possibly connected with the relationship between Cyrene and Egypt in the Hellenistic period under the Ptolemaic uh, rulers. Also uh, standing up, very substantial ruin on the site of Ptolemaeus is this huge fortress, a late Roman building, um, built by 518, at which time a long inscription was carved into its outer wall by the Emperor Anastasius. How much earlier than that it was built, we're not sure, but certainly it was in existence by 518. The south site of Tokra, or Tankira, uh, has been even less explored. Again, here is a plan of the site, <coughs> uh, and the excavations of Boardman and Hayes took place just here on the foreshore in the 1960s. Uh, they found a lot of very interesting early pottery from different parts of the Greek world, relating, they thought, to a precinct, a temple precinct of some sort, which they didn't discover, uh, but 
that whole area has now been eroded by the sea uh, and, uh, and lost to erosion. The twin sites of U.S. Perides uh, and its successor, Berenike, uh, we're now all the way around here. They lie beneath modern Benghazi, uh, as uh, I said earlier. Uh, but part of Berenike uh, was target of a rescue excavation in the 1970s, seen here uh, from the air an area of a 19th century cemetery which had preserved this space up until that time from the encroachment of modern development uh, and which the municipality then decided to, to develop and they started bulldozing it and big chunks of mosaic and stuff were coming out of the ground uh, and the Department of Antiquities uh, called for help uh, and a lot of young Brits, including myself, were sent out there to conduct a rescue excavation. Uh, and the earlier site, this uh, covers the period from the middle of the 3rd century BC down to the Arab conquest, but the earlier site of US Verides uh, was a few kilometers away, and that extends from the 7th or 6th century BC down to the point when it was transferred uh, and uh, that has been examined uh, in several different periods in the 50s, the 60s and the 90s. But as you can see from this one, neither of these sites has much now to show. But I want to move away now from major sites to some of the plentiful small towns and villages of antiquity which have been little studied but which certainly invite investigation. Only the very beginnings of any sort of field survey have ever been done on the countryside, and that was mostly around 1950. I'm going to take you now to an ancient village, just 20 minutes drive or thereabouts from Cyrene, uh, and certainly accessible in any ordinary car. This is one of a dense string of settlements at the northern edge of the upper escarpment of the gel all the way along here. We don't know its ancient name, but its modern name is Magonis. Here it is under the BDI of Google Earth. There are no modern structures here except at right at the top of the frame, but there are numerous large and complex buildings visible and some stretches of water that look like quarries and cisterns and perhaps a moat around this building here that uh, is uh, an area of water there. Here is a plan drawn uh, from that image. But the settlement originates as early as the 5th century BC uh, at least is evident from the tombs, the upstanding tombs at number one on the plan. Uh, you see a drawing of one of these cylindrical drum tombs here, and it's got a little rectangular temple tomb next to it, and those are thought to belong to the 5th century BC. Elsewhere, uh, ashlar masonry with uh, fine drafted edges suggests surviving Hellenistic work, uh, and probably much of what is otherwise visible belongs to the late Roman uh, or Byzantine. There are several large farm complexes, like this one you see here, standing to a considerable height. There is also, uh, at number three on my plan, what has been described alternately by a citadel or as a church. It's clearly a building of central importance. It is partially surrounded by a rock-cut moat, which I pointed out earlier, and it has a single arched entrance on the north side just there. Um, internally, uh, the crowns of several arches are visible around, probably around the central courtyard. To me, the fact that it is aligned north-south rather than east-west uh, is a fatal objection to the hypothesis that it was a church. And there is, in fact, another very evident church in the settlement. Finally, 
finally, this village possesses, at number five on my plan, a bath building in remarkably good state of repair. It's still got its original roof. It's possible to make a complete plan of the building, uh, and as I said, the roofing is still in place over much of it. One can see where the heating flues came up through the roof at the corners, uh, and the little skylight openings which <coughs> we are so familiar with in later Turkish baths. Uh, and that is certainly a literary structure. The site we've just looked at is not obviously threatened in any way at the present time, but I'm going to take you now to one that has actually been obliterated since I was there in 2010. This lies about 25 kilometers to the west of Cyrene, next to the modern village of Massa. Just to the north of the modern village, on a bare hillside, is the ancient village of Artemis, a Greek settlement which again goes back probably to the 5th century BC. Um, there are temple tombs uh, around the perimeter, <coughs> and it survived for long enough to have had a church in the late Roman period. The general view has the, the, the ruins have never been excavated nor accurately surveyed. Uh, but you can see this vast champ de ruines, as the French would say, on the hillside just outside the modern village. Uh, and walking around that, it was entirely possible to make out the lines of ancient streets. And it was also clear from fallen rocks that there were some very substantial monumental buildings in this really quite modest <coughs> settlement. Um, here are a couple of the tombs just a little way outside the village. There's one here and there's another one over there. There are also uh, in the immediate vicinity ancient field boundaries of the classical period still standing stone or the steps marching through the countryside. Telling us where the field boundaries were in the classical period. Sadly, this is representative of a serious threat which is now widespread in Saranaka since uh, the events of 2011 that of uncontrolled speculative development. The successive imagery of Google Earth is sufficient to show what has happened. Though I have also received reports uh, from the ground about this. Here is the site as it was in 2012. There's the modern village down there. Here again you can see considerable elements of the ancient <coughs> village visible on the surface <coughs> in 2012. <coughs> and then there begin to be buildings around the edge of it. And now it's been bulldozed for building. And the buildings are appearing all over it. Uh, the blue marker uh, in the center there is my GPS marker for the position of the church. Uh, when I was there, it was possible to make out where it was. Uh, it was no longer possible to get into the subterranean crypt, which had been uh, surveyed by John Ward Perkins and Sheila Gibson uh, in uh, the 1970s, and that is unlikely to come to light again until some vehicle on the new road falls into the unsuspecting void beneath. These two examples must stand for a host of other rural settlements, of which the most substantial remnants are frequently now their churches, uh, all predating the Arab conquest of 645. And one of the only landscape features which has been in any sense systematically recorded. Uh, here is one of these in the countryside 
at Rasa Hilal, which was excavated in 1960 by Martin Harrison. Farms occur both in villages that we've been looking at and as isolated structures in the landscape. <coughs> the limestone of the Jabal Akhtar is on the whole easily worked, and these buildings are often of high quality dressed stone, stone being more plentiful and easier to build with than any of the timber that was available in this sort of terrain. And because of the, the quality of this stone work, uh, it was argued for a time that these, a lot of these must be military structures, only the art of the government like this. Well, no. Uh, they are certainly built defensively, uh, with a solid enclosure and a single arch entrance, but we should surely regard them as farms, uh, and one might perhaps draw a parallel uh, with the, the peel towers in the border between England and Scotland, something of that sort. Uh, here is an example, uh, just 500 metres to the southwest of Massa, on the other side <coughs> of the modern village, uh, visible from the main road. American maps of Libya made in the 1960s put a name to it, they called it Gaz Zavura, the farmer on whose land it stands, and who incidentally was delighted that anybody should take an interest in it. He Clearly, he knew nothing about it, but he, as a worker on the land, could relate to the fact <coughs> that somebody many years earlier had lived on that land and worked it. And he was proud of it and took care of it, uh, but he couldn't tell us a name for it. Uh, anyway, you see here the typical style of mason of these buildings with a projecting string course, narrow slit windows, and single arch entrance. This is considered broadly late Roman in date. Uh, nobody has excavated one of these things in the pottery. But fallen from it is a block with a cross carved on it, indicating that uh, occupation fell at least partly during the Christian period. What you also see here is a broad sloping revetment against the outside of the building. Here with a return next to the entrance, and then so here along this side. This is found in many buildings in the region, including churches, and it's been suggested in some instances that it was defensive in intent, in others that it was intended to shore up an unstable structure. But it's always seemed to me that if you've already got a vertical wall, um, this is actually weakening its defensive character because it's rather easier to climb up that than the vertical wall. Anyway, in this instance, the evidence seems to me uh, as clear as it could possibly be. Part of the revetment has collapsed and has been tidied away by the farmer, exposing the wall against which it has rested. The state of this wall shows unequivocally that it has been rent from top to bottom by earthquake damage. The region is seismic, there are plenty of possible occasions for such an event in the late Roman or Byzantine period. Well, from farms I want to move on very briefly to military buildings. In Roman times there was no legion stationed in South America, but there must have been auxiliary units and military forces of some kind in order to protect the settled zone from the depredations of the semi-nomadic tribes on its fringes who were not included in the prosperity of <coughs> the uh, colonists, you might still call them that, uh, in the coastal region. We do know that towards the middle of the 3rd century AD, there was a cavalry unit, the first cohort of Macedonians, stationed at Cyrene. Now, I've already referred to and shown the fortress of the Dukes, the Byzantine fortress at Ptolemaeus. Another great castle, which has impressed all modern travellers, dominates the dissected limestone plateau a little way to the west of Nessa. This is Gazerun Migdal, or Ebn Migdal. It has to be said that, once again, for lack of specific archaeological <coughs> investigations, uh, the plan was drawn by Richard Goodchild uh, in about 1960, but no excavation has been done there. It's impossible to be certain that this imposing structure is primarily military. 
it could have been one of the monasteries known to have existed in the vicinity. A few kilometres to the south of this lies the more obviously military stronghold of Gaza al-Shahdain. There is here a castle on a prominent hilltop with a surrounding ditch and drawbridge and a vast complex of outbuildings. Uh, it was approached from here and there was evidently a drawbridge uh, next to this gate house here before one got into the inner area. The lower floor of the keep is preserved in its entirety, and the whole thing is a veritable Schlosskoldnitz of the Roman world. What with the surrounding ditch, off which there are rock cut stables, and outer defences where the approach road reaches the causeway across the ditch, there can be no doubt that this is a military stronghold. It seems to me very likely that it is the castle of Bombaya, which was described in the early 5th century AD by Bishop Synesius of Ptolemaeus in the following terms. Bombaya, he wrote, is a mountain full of caverns where art and nature have combined to form an impregnable fortress. It has been long celebrated and justly. They often compare it to the subterranean vaults of Egypt, but today everyone admits that there are no walls behind which one could be safer than at Bombaya. The moment one enters this place, one is in a regular level challenging to penetrate. Richard Goodchild, who as controller of antiquities for Cyrenaica in 1953, gave us the most thorough description yet available of these military sites, added a third to the chain of defences in this area. This was Gasl al Bushish, described by him as a small unditched watchtower, some six kilometres to the southeast of Gazal al -Shahdin. This building is extraordinarily well preserved. It is complete on one side up to the parapet around it. That is as high as it has ever stood. We see again the same handsome masonry that we've seen in other military structures, but also in fires. Looking now from the opposite direction, and remembering Gazra Sarura near Massa, which I showed you earlier, I suspect that this is in fact on, not a military site, and that it was felled in an earthquake. Here the damage was not limited to some cracks in the perimeter wall, but resulted in the total collapse of half of the building and its consequent abandonment. It could be really interesting to carry out excavations here. One might even find the hapless oculus inside, or at least be able to establish from their belongings uh, the nature of the occupation whether this is military or not. Far to the southwest of Cyrenaica, away from the Jebel Akhtar, and at the point where the habitable territory gives way definitively to the deserts of the Celtic Gulf, Goodchild also sought and found Roman military defences. At Gazar al Hunayla, a little way to the south of Ashdavia, he described a fort with a rock cut moat and a number of detailed features below ground level, including stables and a latrine. The design is astonishingly complex. A note that while the stables in the ditch may be accessed both from within the castle and from outside the ditch, any attacker penetrating past those stables into the ditch would be forced by a narrow rock wall at this point to go around all four sides of the castle before we can get into the inner building itself. <coughs> so a very good defensive structure. Goodchild suggested it was constructed in the first century AD uh, and was reused in the sixth, if not used continuously throughout. Well, this is a site which calls out for re-examination, but my early inquiries in 2010 were met with some hesitation and Google Earth tells us why. Uh, here we are, it's out in the countryside, a little bit south of Ejdabia, going a little bit closer, and it seems to be in the centre. Here's our Roman castle, which I'll show you in a moment, but it's in the middle of a huge military compound, which actually looks like a munitions depot with all these 
countries. Uh, so I was not able to get there in 2010, but having seen John Simpson reporting from that location in the spring of 2011, I thought in the following year um, that it was worth having a look. And there, incidentally, still that same Google Earth image going as close as you can. There is the Roman footstep in the middle of this depot. Uh, anyway, in 2012, uh, there was a big hole in the perimeter wall, which it was possible to walk through. There was nobody there, uh, so we went to have a look. Um, there's still a lot of munitions on the site. Um, it was possible to walk into one of these bunkers. because this is why Libya is. Uh, is just flowing with weaponry. Um, uh, you know, if I had a vehicle, I could have loaded up as much as I wanted of this stuff and gone off with it. And indeed, uh, a week or so after this, I saw somebody in one of the neighbouring villages who'd previously been a military commander but had now gone home. He got a great stack of this stuff just behind the gate of his villa. Um, anyway, there is the, the castle. It's still there. Uh, it has been damaged because somebody in the military at some point thought that the underground structures might be a security risk, so they ran a bulldozer over the top of it. Um, but uh, clearly some of the substructures are still there. Good child identified two other castles in South America as belonging to the same time. The more easterly of these, at Aymara towards Dona, is now barely beneath the buildings of the modern village. But the other, uh, Gaza uh, Rimfayat, some 35 kilometers south of Cyrene, um, and now still in open country, way down here, it was possible to visit. Um, and so far as I know, no archaeologists have been there between Butchard in 1950 and myself in 2012. Uh, it is relatively well preserved. Uh, its perimeter wall stands some two meters high, directly on the inner edge of a rock cut ditch. It's clearly been designed by the engineer who was responsible for the other site we've just been looking at. <coughs> for you can see here the broken remains of a similar blocking wall going across part of the ditch, um, requiring one to do that same circuit if you're going to get into the ditch from the outside and then get into the inner castle. Uh, and what is more, though no openings are currently visible in the exposed sides of the ditch, there most certainly are basement uh, rooms beneath the castle. I was able to identify two of these and to climb down into one of them, as you see here, uh, which is approximately three meter cube. While I find no pottery at Gazra Hinea, I did find pottery on the ground at this site, from which it was clear that it had been occupied during the 2nd and 3rd centuries AD, but not in the Byzantine period. Uh, so this was not part of the late Roman premises, but certainly of the early or middle Roman period. Returning to the previous view, note here that this masonry, whilst it's nice national masonry, it's not the same as what we've seen on those late Roman buildings. It doesn't have the street courses um, and clearly elements to an early period. <clears throat> well, this has been just a glimpse of the archaeological riches that Saranica has to offer. What is visible belongs largely to the Roman and Byzantine periods, but there is much early material as tomb robbers in this period of anarchy are discovered. Typically, Tripolitania has not suffered unduly from this, but Cyrenaica is quite close to the Egyptian border. The Egyptians are thoroughly wise to the potential uh, and the management of the antiquities market, and they are coming to places like Cyrene and Ptolemais and their excavated tombs. I've been involved in the archaeology of both halves of Libya since the 1970s. Uh, in 2005, I started leading cultural tours there, and I felt the need for up-to-date archaeological guidebooks in English. So what I've described to you this evening derives very largely from exploratory visits to write such a guidebook. Uh, in 2010, and then after 
to uh, Revolution in 2012. And so an early guidebook was published in The Cyrenaica Guidebook was uh, published in 2013 um, in the hope that uh, archaeology, uh, that, that both archaeology and tourism would benefit following the revolution, uh, but that has yet to be the case. Though the translation of the book into Arabic, which is underway, may be hoped to lead at the very least to a better appreciation of the antiquities by those who live around them. But when times are more settled, this landscape will constitute an open invitation to archaeologists to study it and to learn from it. It's a veritable open door, like this fantastic gateway on the upper Jebel at Cyrene, which once led into the long-vanished estate of some rich Roman landowner.